Veganism was never something that was on my radar. Mm -hmm. Growing up, I, I was in a family who were skeptical of vegetarianism, to put it lightly, wow. didn't know what a vegan was growing up. And it all changed me really when I started to become aware of certain aspects of my diet and how that impacted animals. What we sometimes do when we think about veganism from an ethical perspective is we think about it being like, well, meat, dairy and eggs is bad. But sometimes we don't think about why. Meat, dairy and eggs are a symptom of the problem. Leather is another symptom. I think the cause of the problem and the main problem is our mentality towards animals. Mm -hmm. You know, We view them with such little regard. We view them as having such little worth that all of the things that we do to them instantly become morally permissible because we view them with such little worth. You know, if we started viewing pigs, cows, chickens, lambs, all of these animals in a similar way to the way that we view dogs, well, that changes because the way that we view dogs means that we assign them so much worth that cutting their throat would be instantly immoral in our eyes. So I think there is a disconnect between what children do naturally feel towards animals and then what we force them to partake in. Because no innocent five-year-old child who loves animals wants a pig to be in a slaughterhouse having their throat cut for them. It seems like the antithesis of what a child would like. They don't have this species bias. They don't discriminate based on species form. That's what we adults do and then we put that on them when they're growing up. Hey everyone and welcome back to another episode of A Millennial Mind. If you haven't already, please, please, please can you do me a massive favor and press the subscribe or follow button wherever you're listening or watching to this. Only 4% of you that watch and listen to this podcast are actually following it and the bigger the show gets, the bigger the guests get and the bigger the experience gets too. Thank you so much for all of your support so far. Let's get into the episode. Ed. Hi. Welcome to Millennial Mind. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm really happy to have you here. I've been watching your videos for a really long time. Oh. And, you know, it feels like a real honor to have you because you are one of the most articulate, calm, you know, peaceful people to listen to. So oh. I'm really happy to have oh, you. Oh, well, that's nice. I appreciate those kind words very much. But yeah, thank you for inviting me on. I'm looking forward to what we have to discuss. So for people who don't know who you are, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I... Um, work mainly around veganism so advocating for veganism predominantly from an ethical perspective but mm -hmm. also looking at the, you know the environmental and um, health benefits of doing so as well so i have a youtube channel social media stuff i'm an author i own a couple of plant-based restaurants and and do a lot of public speaking around veganism so just Amazing. hopefully trying to do everything i can to get people to to understand the benefits of veganism so they can make choices more in alignment with their actual feelings because i think that's an important part of this is Definitely. where do we sit on this this conversation because mm -hmm. because for many people we've just never really heard the arguments for veganism or at least not in a compelling way perhaps i agree i think you know the term veganism or when someone says they're vegan already just has people's backs up yeah you know i when i was vegan for three years i felt every single time i'll tell someone they would tell me one of five things they would say you always have to say it right stop going on about it yeah nobody cares you know you sit on a leather sofa anyway yeah. so you know at home you should i should apparently sit on the floor oh yeah and um, it's not healthy for you. Mm -hmm. So I was always riddled with all these things, but you know, I've grown up vegetarian. I mean, I used to eat meat a little, I think for like a, mu a few months when I was younger and my mum was vegetarian. So she took me to a farm right? and she was like, this is what you eat. And I was so scared and so mortified I stopped eating it. Is that right? Yeah. So your family weren't or aren't vegetarian? It was a decision you we made? Were, we were brought up vegetarian. Right. So, you know, generally in our household, everyone we weren't ever allowed meat in the house. Right. Um, but weirdly enough, it was like, girls shouldn't really eat it. Boys, it's okay if you do. Oh, interesting. Very bizarre. Yeah. Um, but my mum hated the fact that I ate meat. She hated it. So right. she just took me to a farm or zoo. I can't remember what it was or something like that. And I remember her pointing out the animals and saying, this is what you eat. And I got so upset and so scared that I just stopped. Wow. And then, you know, as I've grown up vegetarian, I've I've now, I don't think I could ever eat meat. Sure. Um, but yeah, I, I have heard this argument around veganism come up a few times and I was really, you know, thinking about it a few years ago and I made that change. I was living out. Um, I thought it would be much easier with living out, um, which it was. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I still kind of think, could I go vegan? Uh, I think I could. But I have a lot of reservation and a lot of hesitation. And a lot of that is based around social mm. um, gatherings, a lot around judgment. Yeah. I feel that vegan, people see veganism as, a, veganism as an extreme thing. 
right? And often when people see things as an extreme thing, they then start to poke holes in every other part of your life to say, well, if you think you're so perfect and you're holy in that area, well, actually, Shivani, you shouldn't be doing this and you shouldn't be doing that. And it, it, it just feels like it's, it's harder to approach the conversation because everyone's always trying to attack you on it. I think there is this idea that, veganism's, uh, that vegans have kind of put themselves at the, the yeah. top of this ethical ladder. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not true, mm -hmm. you know? But I think that there's this idea. And so the default, I think, when you view someone as positioning themselves as some sort of ethical authority or even like an environmental authority, yes. you know, we see it in the environmental community as well. A lot of the time, the instant reaction is to try and point out inadequacies or, as you say, kind of flaws or contradictions. Oh, you don't live perfectly. Therefore, yeah. everything you do is in invalidated. Yeah. But I think this this appeal to perfection is really stifling because we can't live perfectly. You know, we live in a in a world where we do have to consume, where we do have to engage in in, you know, life. And that mm -hmm. means that we won't be devoid of causing damage, devoid of causing harm. But you know, ultimately, we should try and minimize it where we can. And choosing plants over animals is one of the simplest and easiest ways. And also one of the most beneficial ways that we can right. mitigate the harm that we cause. You're so right. I mean, I know after this podcast, I'm going to be like, right, I'm doing it. And everyone can see my podcast with Ed. So I'm doing it and no one questioned me on it. But I want to start with, you know, you, you weren't always vegan, were you? Were no, you? no. And I love that because... A lot of people say, I grew up eating meat. There is no way that I would ever change. Yeah. Tell me about that transition and where you first started to learn around veganism. Yeah, I mean, it's funny really, because I used to, to think the same before I was vegan. Sometimes people say to me now, oh, you must have never, never had bacon. Yeah. I'm like, I had it for, you know, 20 years. Or you've never had fried chicken or you've never had this and you've never had that. And the truth is I, I, I did and I really liked it. You know, steak was my favorite food. Well, fried chicken was my favorite. Steak was mm -hmm. number two. Halloumi was number three. And for me, it was never, veganism was never something that was on my radar. Mm -hmm. Growing up, I, I was in a family who were skeptical of vegetarianism, to put it lightly. Wow. Didn't, didn't know what a vegan was growing up. And it all changed me really when I started to become aware of certain aspects of, of my diet mm -hmm. and how that impacted animals. So for example, like I said just a moment ago, fried chicken was my favorite food. I went mm. to KFC a couple of times a week. My local KFC was my, you know, my, my, my bi-weekly pilgrimage. And I remember one day reading this story on the BBC. This was back in 2014. And the story was about a truck that had crashed on the way to a slaughterhouse near Manchester. And the truck was carrying about six and a half thousand chickens. Hundreds of the chickens had died from the crash. There were hundreds more with broken bones, broken wings. They were mutilated on the side of the road. I was reading this story feeling sorry for chickens, which was an unusual thing for me to do at that time, empathize with the chicken, right? Mm. But in my fridge was the leftovers of a KFC from the evening previously. And I thought to myself, hang on a minute, I'm empathizing with chickens who are suffering, mm. but in my fridge is the reason why they go into a slaughterhouse. So I went vegetarian because of that. And then about eight months later, I saw a documentary called Earthlings. Mm -hmm. And um, that really showed me that actually, I think, what we sometimes do when we think about veganism from an ethical perspective is we think about it being like, well, meat, dairy, and eggs is bad, but sometimes we don't think about why. And I think what Earthling showed me is that actually meat, dairy, and eggs are a symptom of the problem. It's like you were saying with leather earlier, leather's another symptom. I think the cause of the problem and the main problem is our mentality towards animals. Mm -hmm. You know, we view them with such little regard. We view them as having such little worth that all of the things that we do to them instantly become morally permissible because we view them with such little worth. Mm -hmm. But if we, you know, if we started viewing pigs, cows, chickens, lambs, all of these animals in a similar way to the way that we view dogs, well, that changes because the way that we view dogs means that we assign them so much worth so that cutting their throat would be instantly immoral in our eyes. So what that documentary showed me is that meat, dairy, and eggs were symptoms of the issue. And what I really need to do is challenge how I view non-human animals and not necessarily view them as the, the same as I view yourself or myself mm -hmm. because we are all different, but view them with the consideration they deserve, which instantly means that what we do to them should be viewed as wrong and immoral. I think it's such an interesting debate because a lot of people say, I would never, ever, ever eat a dog. Yeah. But I would always eat a cow or a lamb or, yeah. you know, another animal. And it it sometimes scares me how people can be so shocked that in China they eat dogs because that's yeah. their culture, right. right? And I saw, a, I can't remember what animal it was. Maybe it was an octopus or something. It was on TikTok, okay? Yeah. And this girl was eating this moving animal and it was going into her mouth. And 
everyone was like, that is disgusting. You are disgusting. And she was like, can we please just take a step back? It's my culture. Right. Just how in the UK you eat beef. Yeah. And everyone's like, it's not the same. We don't eat living animals. Like it's, they're, they're killed already. And a, a lot of the argument is, you know, animals are kill, gonna be killed anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a lot of people's arguments, you know. They're going to be killed anyway. They're used for leather primarily. So, you know, we're just eating it. And I'm one person. So me being one person is not going to take that off the shelf. And right. I had this argument with someone else the other day. And they said, well, I'm not killing the animal. Right. I'm technically not killing the animal. And I replied, so if I get a sniper to kill you, I technically haven't killed you, there right? There exactly. Um, but, they always, but the argument is always the meat is going to be on the shelf. You're never going to get rid of it. So why should I go vegan? Well, I mean, the meat's there for one reason, and that's because we demand it to be there exactly. through purchasing it. So you know, obviously, as an individual, we're not going to change the world. We're not going to mm -hmm. change the whole food system. But everything that's ever happened that's been positive, indeed even negative, but if we view it from a positive perspective, every social change, every progression that we've made has come about because individuals formed movements or formed groups. So yes, you know, you and I as individuals are not mm -hmm. going to disrupt the whole animal agriculture industry, but a group of people formed of millions of individuals, well, then all of a sudden change can start to happen. And I think we, we, you know, we're already seeing that. Veganism mm -hmm. is population-wise still small. Yes. As much as it, you know, pains me to say it, it's true. We're only in single digits when it mm -hmm. comes to percentage-wise, right? So we've got a lot to, to do and a lot to, to, lot to hopefully achieve in a hopefully a short period of time. But even with what we have now, there are changes emerging, you know, and an awareness that's growing. And that's because individuals are making their voices heard, either through vocalizing why they're vegan or simply just by living vegan. Because when we start to buy different things in a supermarket, we demand that different things be supplied. So true. So when we buy a piece of, of, of cow flesh from a supermarket, sure, that cow's already dead. But by buying that, we're asking the supermarket to pay the farm farming industry to right. provide another cow. And so we're actually paying for another animal in the future to be killed through that process. And you're, you're totally right, because I think when I was vegan, there were about I don't know, Alpro, maybe um, a couple of other brands, I can't remember them off the top of my head, that had alternative milks. Right. Now there is an entire section in yeah. every supermarket you go to. You know, I used to love this chocolate called Vigo. I don't know how I'm saying I it right. I love that chocolate. Isn't it the best it's chocolate so good. in the whole world? Absolutely, okay. Yeah. I used to go to this vegan shop in Nottingham and buy it once yeah. a week because it's really expensive. So I used to go I used to go and buy it and be like, oh my God, this is a treat. Yeah. But you know, one of the arguments for that, like, as I've just said, is a lot of people find it expensive. Sure. Buying a pint of milk is very different from buying, you know, a pint of soy milk or a pint of oat milk. And right. a lot of people find that, you know, how we've said, you know, small, small changes, you know, can actually build up a lot, especially with this cost of living crisis at the moment. So yeah. how do people survive and kind of make that change for their bodies when there is a cost of living crisis at the moment? It's a very, very good question. I think the first thing to establish is why food costs the amount it does. And it's mm -hmm. not because that's the price that we pay is reflective of the price of the actual product. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is when we look at how agriculture is propped up, it's propped up with subsidies. So this is taxpayers funds that's given by the government to industries to help bring down the prices of certain products. So in, in the UK, for example, we give billions of pounds to animal farmers and to feed producers, which drives down the cost of, of animal product um, Wow. Of, of these animal products to us. But we don't do the same with certain alternatives or certain plant products. Obviously we do subsidize fruits and vegetables, but nowhere near to the same mm -hmm. standards. So when we're buying cheap chicken and cheap bacon and cheap pork products, the price that we don't see is the price that's incurred to our environment, mm -hmm. which is paid through environmental cleanup costs. We don't see the price to our health because they're absorbed in our healthcare system. Um, and we don't see the price to the, reflect, the truly reflective price of what these products should cost mm. because of these taxpayer incentives, because of the manner in which these animals are farmed. So what we need to do is shift how agriculture is funded and how it's subsidized. But as things are now, yes, some plant-based alternatives do cost more. Mm -hmm. But there is another alternative there, which is not looking at alternatives, but looking at whole plant foods. So I'm talking about legumes, grains, fruits, mm -hmm. vegetables, really the staples of what a healthy plant-based diet would be anyway. Yeah. So thinking less beyond burgers, less oatly, and thinking more whole plant foods, the healthiest foods that we can buy um, instantly as well. Because actually those are the cheapest foods we can buy in a supermarket. And if you want to mm -hmm. compare a tin of chickpeas versus a, a pack of steak, you know, and even when you look at nutritionally speaking as mm -hmm. well to find those comparables, you'll still find those whole plant foods are cheaper. So what I always say to people is, work within your means, work within your budget, mm -hmm. but look for those cheaper plant-based foods and see what you can incorporate in, in that regard. Because 
IV veganism is a similar way to viewing meat consumption from a from a financial perspective. Now, you can eat red meat and go to McDonald's and pay very little for red meat, or you can go to a high-end steakhouse and pay a lot for red meat. And I think veganism can be viewed the same. You can do it with a very large budget, but you can also do it with a small budget as well. So just make it work for you. That's so true. I think one of the things that people always, you know, bring out as well is, well, how do you get your protein? Mm. This is one of the questions that I've asked uh, Gemma as well. She was on the oh, yeah. podcast. And, you know, people always rush and say, you know, as a woman, Shivani, you're going to need protein, you're, you're going to have be low in iron, um, you're going to feel weak, yeah. all of these things were told to me, right? And I think a lot of people are hesitant, especially men that I've spoken to, to go vegan, because they're worried that they're not going to be able to build muscle. Right. Well, I mean, I think that the skepticism around veganism isn't a bad thing. I actually think it's good, because whilst it's not true that you can't get these nutrients in a plant-based diet. I think it's important for people to recognize that you have to be aware of how to do it. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't think that we're just getting these nutrients when we eat food. We should be fully aware that these nutrients come from these sources and these ones come from those sources. Because if we don't know, then we can't feel confident or empowered to know that we are eating what our body needs. So I think it's mostly a matter of just taking some time to look at where you can get protein from. Um, and actually in the case of iron for women, it it is actually very important. You know, iron for women, especially because women need more iron than mm -hmm. men. I think it is especially important that women who make that change are aware of how they're getting iron because, you know, it's very easy to avoid certain nutrients if you don't know where you're going to get them from. So just take some time to, to, to educate yourself, find, find where you can get nutri nutrients from in different sources. And for men, when it comes to, to protein, it's, it's, it's really surprisingly easy. Okay. Protein, well, food is made up of three macronutrients, protein, fats, carbohydrates, and obviously mm -hmm. different foods have different ratios. But when you look at protein in plants, you can get protein in, in legumes. So that mm -hmm. includes things like chickpeas and lentils and, and soybeans. You can get it in grains like brown rice and whole, whole grain pastas. You can get it in certain vegetables like Brussels sprouts and broccoli. So it isn't really a question of if you can do it, it's just a question of how you can do it. And a few little swaps, a few little changes, and just um, a good rotation of different plant-based foods will easily get you to where you need to be. But what about if someone said to you, okay, well, Ed, I'm gonna get, I don't know, 30 grams of protein in my steak. How many how many broccoli stalks would oh, I need yeah. to eat for that? Well, that's a fair point. I mean, obviously broccoli and steak isn't comparable when it comes to protein, but in terms of there being protein in broccoli there is mm -hmm. so i think if you're saying well let's let's find something that's an alternative to steak then opt for something like tofu tofu is a, a complete protein what that means is it has all the essential amino acids our body needs as does meats and dairy and eggs so that's a good one there's also something called seitan we were talking about temple of seitan, seitan. Yeah. it's an incredible protein source as well as being awfully delicious when it when it's done right of course so i think it's just about finding what a, a direct alternative would be mm -hmm. and obviously viewing broccoli not as an alternative to steak right. but an add-on that can also boost your protein as well as give you things like vitamin c and and all the good stuff that we can find in green vegetables as well yeah i, th I think that's what's really important is Look, of course, it's easier to follow what we've done for years and years and years and years and just stick to the diet that we know. Yeah. But if we want to make a change, it does require a little bit of work. And I think that's what people are a little bit hesitant about. You sure. know, I believe that if you ask most people to kill the animal, slaughter it yeah. with blood everywhere. And I don't know what you have to do to it after, but you have to, to put it onto a plate. They wouldn't do it. No, I actually think people wouldn't. But there's a massive disconnect now. How are we going to change that mindset of people to really realize like, okay, when I'm killing an animal, this is what I'm doing? Because yeah. the tricky part is, and, and maybe this is my fault a little bit here, okay? I have said that when I have children, yeah. I would like to raise them as vegetarian. Right. Okay. Um, and I've said that, God forbid if I said vegan, by the way, as you'll hear in this conversation. So I said I would like to raise them as vegetarian until yeah. they are 11 years old and they're of a sound mind and they can make their own decisions. Yeah. Because I believe that up until 11, you don't really know what's going on. You're a child, whatever. You're very conditioned. And I think that, you know, if you've eaten meat your whole life, it is harder to kind of stop eating it. So right. look, if my child turned around to me and said, look, I really want to eat it, I would obviously explain what it was. And if they said, look, I don't care about killing an animal, then I'd say, fine, okay, you're no child of mine. So whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, whatever. Absolutely. Now, when I said that, I got an attack by so many people that said, so because a lot of people in my family eat meat. Right. So they were saying, so what are you going to say? All these people are bad people. And I said, well, I'm not going to say they're bad people. But they said, well, your children are then going to think everyone's a bad person. 
and you're coercing them to do something that isn't right. And I, I had this debate for about two hours, okay? And I just gave up. I said, you know what? I'm not having kids, so forget it. I've just decided I'm not going to have children. <laughs> but people seem to get really annoyed when you call people out for eating meat. Why is it? I think that meat is a, is a symbol. It's not simply about sustenance and, and nutrition and calories. It's about identity, because food mm. is identity. It's culture. It's, as you say, it's history, it's upbringing, it's social. You know, when we think about our parents, our grandparents, our friends, a lot of the time that we spend together is centered around the consumption of food. And we lo a lot of the time we think about our grandparents, we think about grandma's mm. spaghetti bolognese or you know, whatever dish it might be. And we, we hold so much power and we, and we give so much power to food because it, it's more than just what it, it technically is. Mm -hmm. So I think when you question people's food consumption, you're, you're questioning their identity, you're questioning their culture, you're questioning how they view themselves in the world. And I think when we start to assign ethical um, implications to food, or we start to create um, the idea of, of morality within food, we're actually questioning who we are. Mm. And I think when we start to say things like, eating meat is immoral, which is a statement I make regularly and, and, yes. and obviously stand by. The implication of that is I'm saying you are immoral. Oh, yes, And that's a hard thing for someone to hear. And it's not quite as simple as that because the human brain is very complex and we don't always act, act rationally. We don't always mm -hmm. act in our own best interest. Mm -hmm. You know, we act on impulse or we act on um, kind of um, behaviors that have been given to us based on previous experiences, you know, it's super complicated like that and fascinating. So it's not as simple as saying you are bad because you do this, because there's a complexity there, which which can often be ignored when we simplify a debate down to those kind of terms. So I think it's about recognizing that something can be bad, but that doesn't mean that we are inherently bad because we are products of our environment, products of our culture. Mm -hmm. And as you say, changing something which is so ingrained within us and is also done by the majority of people around us yes. is actually quite a difficult thing. Thing when viewed within the context of what it means and what it symbolizes. Mm -hmm. So yes, something can be immoral and bad, but that doesn't define us necessarily because there's a nuance there that also has to be addressed. It's tricky though. That's a really empathetic and a lovely way to put it. I wish I was that empathetic. I sometimes think it, it gets me quite frustrated because I just think that everyone has the choice to live the way that they want to, mm -hmm. right? However, if I say, look, when I bring a child into the world, okay, when I, if I really want to bring someone into the world and I would like them to not eat me, yeah. I don't understand why some people would be so offended yeah. that they want the ch that, that child to eat meat. It's irrational, isn't it? It I, is. I agree. But and I've heard some people say, when my kids grow up, they have to eat meat. And it's like they go onto this extreme form because they mm -hmm. think I'm being extreme by saying they should be vegetarian. It's funny, isn't it? People are... I don't know why people are defensive when it comes to to mm. that kind of that kind of choice that we that you know parents make, and I think it is ironic because you know I never chose to eat meat, as, as you say. Okay. When we we can't make choices when we're babies or when we're toddlers. We don't we know we don't know. We're guided by what mm. our parents and and our caregivers you know dictate for us. So it's not a choice for a child to eat meat. And actually, you know, as, as was the case with you when you were younger, you know, when children are confronted with with who they're eating, exactly. it actually can be really hard for them to come yeah. to terms with that. You know, there's there's videos on TikTok, but of course many stories of people as well, who as children realized and didn't want to partake in it. And I think this is the thing, you know, you get a, a toddler and you, you give them a piglet and a puppy. Is, is the toddler gonna start kicking the piglet exactly. and loving the puppy? No, you know, they like exactly. both of them. So I think there is a disconnect between what children do naturally feel towards animals and then what we force them to partake in. Because no, innocent five-year-old child who loves animals wants a pig to be in a slaughterhouse having their throat cut for them mm -hmm. you know and that it seems like the antithesis of what a child would would like and because they don't they don't have this species bias they don't discriminate okay. based on species form that's what we adults do and then we put that on them when they're growing up a lot of people say though you know if you're a child and you're vegan or even even you know for me when i was vegan you're not getting the right nutrients you sure. need yeah, you're not um, eating the right foods. You're gonna fall ill. You're gonna get osteoporosis. That was another one that people oh, really? used to tell me a lot of the time. Your bones will be weak, and mm. you know why are you doing this all? And a lot of people think it's a diet thing, right? Like a like a fad thing. Yeah. What are some of the benefits of going plant based or vegan? And actually, what's the difference between being plant based and vegan? Yeah, I mean, just to 
on the, on the first point you made, I mean, if you are going to raise a child vegan or raise a child pescatarian, vegetarian, or you know, fully omnivorous, make sure you, you do it well. Mm -hmm. Because I think there is this false idea that if you eat meat, then you don't have to worry about anything. Yes. But that's not true. Meat eaters are deficient. They're deficient in things like B12, ironically, but they're also deficient in fiber, in magnesium, in mm -hmm. potassium. So it isn't a simple case of I eat meat, therefore I'm getting all my nutrients because you can just as easily be deficient on a, on a meat-based diet. And it's the same for kids. Absolutely make sure your kids are getting iodine, iron, calcium, omega-3, but do that if they're eating vegan or non-vegan. Mm. Um, so again, it's not a question of if it's possible, it's a question of how it can be made possible. And that's the most important thing to recognize. Um, but in terms of like difference between vegan and plant-based, plant-based is diet, you know, it's, I eat a plant-based diet. Okay. Um, but veganism is, is, is not simply, as you say, about diet. It's actually more about what I was leading to at the beginning. It's kind of more of like a social justice pursuit. It's about trying to recognize and also I suppose, advocate for the fact that non-human animals deserve basic rights, the mm -hmm. right to you know, autonomy, the right to their own bodies, their own lives, the right not to be slaughtered, not to have suffering inflicted upon them. So in essence, it's a pursuit of trying to understand that non-human animals deserve more moral consideration than they're currently given. And I think that's the way to view it. You know, plant-based is about food. Veganism is about a philosophy. It's about challenging this, this current paradigm, this mentality that we have that means that we push the rights of non-human animals under the carpet so we'd have to think about them. Um, so that's the way to view it. What are the health benefits yeah. of going vegan? Well, again, it really depends. You know, you can be a vegan who eats uh, <laughs> processed burgers all day and find very few health benefits, right? <laughs> um, or you can be a vegan who eats, you know, whole plant foods, you know, good variety, um, you know, eats the, all the colors of the rainbow, as, as we often say, drinks water, all the good stuff. And what you'll see then, which can often be the case is, you know, increase energy levels, maybe better sleep. But also I think long-term and mm -hmm. kind of more generally speaking, a plant-based diet has been shown to reduce the risk of certain cancers like colon yeah. cancer, prostate cancer, even breast cancer. It's been shown to reduce the risk of, of heart disease. Mm -hmm. um, so there are significant benefits in terms of its possibility to reduce some of our most prevalent chronic diseases. And that all comes down to how you implement your plant-based diet, you know, yeah. making sure you do it healthy, make sure you combine that with regular exercise. And also, of course, drinking lots of water, getting, you know, good night's sleep, yeah. all of the extra stuff that we should do. But when you combine that all with, of course, a healthy plant-based diet, then you can see the, the reduction in, well, hopefully the reduction in some of those chronic diseases, which is certainly a nice thing. <laughs> so you've, you've written this book, This is Vegan Propaganda. Yes. And the paper version is out this week. It, yes. That's very a, yeah, exciting. Yeah. So congratulations. Thank you. Tell me a little bit about this book. Yeah. So, I mean, the idea behind it was that it was kind of almost a, you know, hopefully a relatively comprehensive detailing of all the main reasons to be vegan. So it's split into three different sections. Okay. The first section is dealing with the ethics. So looking at the philosophy behind veganism, but also looking specifically at what we do to animals, mainly in the UK. Mm -hmm. So it kind of details all of that. The second section is looking at kind of more human impacts. So the environmental impacts, the health impacts, and also the impact from things like pandemics, you know, infectious diseases like bird flu and swine flu and even coronavirus, that, that word we don't ever want to hear again, right? <laughs> And then the last section is looking at some of the social and cultural reasons. Okay. In the first two sections are, are talking about why we should be vegan. But then the third is kind of talking about what we were discussing before, you know, the, those barriers. Mm -hmm. What makes it a bit harder? What, what means that we can't follow this kind of maybe rational decision that it could well seem to us? And I think that's what the third section is looking at. What are some of the social um, aspects to it? What are the psychological barriers? And also, how would does the media represent veganism as well? So yeah, hopefully. in a very negative light, I think. <laughs> well, yes. Maybe. It's getting better. Yeah, you exactly. are right. It is It is getting better. But I definitely think, you know, I remember you, you uploaded something saying there are a lot of viruses that happen because, you know, like bird flu, like you said, coronavirus. Yeah because of the fact that we eat animals. And a lot of people were like, how could you say that? That's so insensitive. It's not because we eat bats. None of us eat bats. The coronavirus didn't happen because of we, we eat animals. When you, when you kind of encounter situations like that, some of them are fact. Okay, look, m a bird flu, swine flu, all of that stuff. Isn't that fact that it did come from an animal? Yeah, absolutely. Like, corona yeah. is still a little bit, nobody knows. Or is it a fact? Well, I mean, there, there, is, there is no definitive um, proof yet, <laughs> although I am of the strong um, belief that it's, it's of zoonotic origin. I mean, coronaviruses come from, from animals. So even if you were to subscribe to the lab leak theory, it still originated from an animal to begin with. It was just the samples were taken into the lab to be tested on and, and spilled out. Although 
I personally don't believe in that. I believe that it was a more um, organic, if if you like, spillage. But um, yes, yeah. Well, everyone believes it's because somebody ate a bat. So even in that, well, that's wrong. In that, that, that camp, is wrong. So yeah. Yeah, that one is. <laughs> it kind of kind of lies. But you know, like I said, a lot of people will combat a lot of things and say, okay, well, Ed, what about almonds? You know, oh, you yeah. can't drink almond milk if you're a vegan mm. because almonds are not vegan, apparently, or avocados. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting. Uh, that's a classic Piers Morgan. Yeah, it is. Sorry. Yeah, I'm really trying not to be Piers. Please, <laughs> please, please don't call me him. <laughs> you are doing a very good job of not being Piers. Yeah, so well done. Um, but it is true. You know, almonds is a difficult one that, that mm -hmm. not only Piers, he's not the only one who brings it up, but it's difficult. Yeah. And I think, so the reason why almonds can often get a bad rep is because in California, bees are used to pollinate not just animal uh, almond orchards, yes. but indeed many different types of crops. Um, and they're also quite water intensive. California is, is a drought stricken state. And so the theory is that, well, hang on a minute, we shouldn't be eating almonds because we are exacerbating drought in California. And um, bees are also used and, and ultimately sometimes even killed because of diseases and the ways mm -hmm. that they're treated. But this is um, a myopic way of viewing the situation. Bees are also used to pollinate alfalfa, which is a primary feed crop used for dairy cows. So actually more bees are used to pollinate animal feed than they are almond orchards. So actually consuming dairy, if it's from California, is, is worse for bees than consuming almonds. The other way to look at it is, again, dairy in California uses way more water than the almond industry. Mm -hmm. And also California produces 80% of the world's almonds but it only produces about a third or so of, of the US's dairy consumption. So 80% wow. of the world's almonds use less water and result in less insects being killed than just the dairy industry in California, which only provides about one third of the dairy consumed in the US. So that gives it a little bit of perspective. Okay. But mm. it, there are still issues there. Yes. And, and I, I actually believe that if we live in, in Europe, obviously you and I, I do, and probably most of your listeners, or at least many of your listeners are probably in, in Europe. There's a simple solution buy almonds from Europe. Alpro, for example, um, their almonds come from Europe. So that yes. means exactly, boom, right? <laughs> and it's the same with Plenish and Provamel. You can get That's almond different. butter that comes from, from Europe. Bayona is a good example. So we don't have to support almonds in California. Got it. So I think that's a simple way of looking at it is. That's so much easier. I know, isn't it? So everyone's going on and on and on about this almond situation. Yeah. I, this is why I'm so happy you're, you've come on because now I've got all the answers to when exactly. people say to me. Exactly. Okay, now let's tackle avocados. Avocados, buy them from Spain. If they're out of season, then maybe don't buy them at all. Because okay. again, look, there, there is an issue with um, avocado production in Mexico. Okay. Again, water usage, but more potentially concerning, there are certain issues related to, to human violence, um, oh, how okay. um, cartels run certain regions in Mexico, the impact that has on local areas. So I, I would maybe say avoid avocados from Mexico if you are concerned about some of those issues. Yeah. And opt again, Spain is a good example, um, but also California is another example. So we don't have to buy avocados from Mexico. Mm -hmm. Although again, the argument could be that, you know, it, it helps avocado farmers in these regions. They, they they deserve a living. They should be given a living as well. But I think it's about diversification. I think what happens when something like almonds or avocados become a boom food and they become really popular is it causes the production to become really intensified. And as a consequence, bad practices can emerge, such as poor water usage, poor fertilizer application, all of these things. But as the industry is allowed to diversify and its production is spread around different areas, it allowed the strain to be reduced because that intensification can be reduced. So I think it's about diversifying where we buy these foods from. Yes. Almonds from Europe, avocados from Europe, or maybe avocados from, from uh, somewhere like Peru or, or California instead. I'm really glad you've mentioned those examples because I think if, if I said to people, well, think about where you buy your avocados or almonds, gosh, everyone would be like, so now I have to check my almonds to buy for you or now I have to check the avocados to buy for you. And I think, you know, it's so simple. Just buy Alpro. It's from, you know, Europe. You it's go. no problem or Plenish or, you know, you named a couple of other brands. So I think it's really important that we make things easy. Yes. Now, you, obviously your book is called Vegan Propaganda. Yeah. And as we've mentioned throughout this podcast, a lot of people see us as us, uh, vegans or vegetarians actually, as extremists. Sure. Now, I was watching an interview and somebody had said it's ridiculous that we that the vegan industry uses words like murder, slaughter, abduct, rape. Right. Because those things can only happen in people. Mm -hmm. They can't happen in animals. There is no sexual activity that goes on when you impregnate a cow. Right. We're not talking about people. We all know we're talking about the rape of cows. And, right. you know, just because it's not sexual, there's not like, I don't know, a sexual thing there doesn't mean they're not being raped. Sure. 
But yeah. what's what's the kind of t- your take on that situation? Because a lot of people will say it's clickbait, or you're saying it as an extreme perspective to try and get people to, like you, like it says here, it's propaganda. Well, language is is very important, and there's two ways of looking at it. Firstly, language has the ability to shock, and also to emphasize the severity of a situation. And a lot of vegans use those words because they want to emphasize that what's happening is is really serious. And we all recognize that those words mean something obviously very serious. There's another way of thinking about it. And, and that is that because language has the power to shock, it also has the power to to distance people from what we're trying to explain. I don't I don't use the word rape when describing it because okay. I, I recognize that it can be um, a provocative word. I recognize that people's experiences mean that maybe they have unfortunately a, a more um, a closer connection with that word than than, than I do. Thankfully, although sadly for them, thankfully for me, selfishly of course, but I, I recognize that people's situations are different, and how we use words and how we drop them into conversations can be challenging for people based on their personal situations. So for me, I I, I don't use them, although that doesn't mean I don't think it is that. Yes. I, I, I do think that it I do think that when you forcibly penetrate an animal, mm-hmm. that is a form of a form of raping them. Mm-hmm. And I think the idea that because it's not strictly sexual that 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 means it's not that thing, well, force penetration is forced penetration. And and for the animal, whether the human finds sexual gratification or financial gratification is neither here nor there because the actual feeling, the sensation, the act, the experience is the same. So I think we shouldn't, I don't, I think it's important for us to acknowledge um, as much as we can with a kind of, um, what would the word be, a logical integrity. We should try and acknowledge that these things are the things that they are. Mm-hmm. But I also understand as, as a vegan who advocates for veganism that the way I use language is important. Yeah. So saying things like forced penetration means the same thing. It has the same connotations, but potentially doesn't bring out the same kind of reaction because it is forcibly penetrating. Yeah. Um, murder is an interesting one. I mean, if you open up a dictionary, the potential for murder to encapsulate animals, I'm not sure if it does necessarily, but murder is kind of a legal term, It, you know, when we view it from, from that way. Again, I don't have to say that it's murdering an animal to get people to recognize that it's wrong to kill an animal, you know? And I think that's the most important thing. I don't have to get people to acknowledge that it's rape or murder. I just have to get them to understand that killing an animal or forcibly penetrating an animal is wrong, wrong. regardless of the words you want to assign to it. And, and that's the way that I approach it. Yeah, and I think that often when you when the, those words are used, it kind of switches people off because yeah. like you said at the start, you know, you're questioning who you are. Right. And you don't want to be labeled a murderer. No. You don't want to be labeled any of those horrible words. So people then just ignore the fact that they've been said. But language is a funny one because mm-hmm. not to be Piers Morgan again, I'm really trying. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I. it's difficult for me to ask this question because I, it's stupid, the answer. You know, people get very annoyed when there's things like vegan sausage rolls. Or the other day, somebody uploaded a story. I hope she's not watching this. She uploaded a story and she said... Why are people calling watermelon tuna? Why is watermelon tuna a thing? Right. Right? And I was I just replied saying, look, there are some people who don't want to eat tuna anymore. They want to find an alternative. Right. So what they have done is create a tuna taste from a watermelon. Right. What do you want them to call it? <laughs> Water what? Watermelon. They're like, just call it watermelon. And I was like, this it, it doesn't make logical sense to me. And when I say, like, I always say chicken because I'm always like, oh, I'm having a chicken burger tonight, but I'm having a, veg- a corn chicken burger sure. or a vegan chicken burger. And people still get confused. And I get that because look, I'm saying I'm having chicken. I'm not saying vegetarian chicken. Yeah. But when people say they're having, you know, a Beyond Meat meat burger, what is the problem? There is no problem. But it's so, that's what I'm saying. It's yeah. annoying I'm asking this question, but it really, that actually annoys me more than anything because I just yeah. think, what what are they doing to you? Like, so what if someone wants to call it watermelon tuna or yeah. so what if someone wants to call it, I don't know, shiitake, whatever? Who cares? I think though that what, I think the reason for that is people like, I mean, for example, the the guy who was setting up the cameras earlier when we were chatting a little bit when, when you were out of the room and he said, I think it'd be hard for me. Yeah. Know, to go vegan. And I think the reason we think it's hard for us is because we think of it as, as deprivation. Oh, I have yes. to give up this. I have to give up that. Yes. But if I say, oh, you don't have to give it up. You just, you eat this instead. So rather than a beef burger, you eat a Beyond Meat burger. You're not, you're not depriving yourself of anything. You're not giving anything up. Mm-hmm. So as soon as people recognize, oh, there is an alternative for that. There is an alternative for this. They can't take that that position of it being hard or, you know, a, mm-hmm. a deprivation because you're, you're, you're not depriving yourself. You're just literally changing the food that gives you that flavor and that satisfaction. So I think that people become reluctant to think of watermelon in, in terms yes. of it being similar to tuna because when you acknowledge that, the reason for why you eat tuna becomes that bit lesser, okay. lesser 
good, you know, less so less important because you've got the alternative there. But I think there's a massive barrier in terms of people just don't want to try it. Now, I, I we've talked about this before, but there was a guy on TV and they gave him a oh, yeah. supposed vegetarian sausage roll and a sup- vegan sausage roll and a supposed normal sausage roll. And he ate them both. And he was like, I definitely can tell that this is the vegan one. Yeah. Then they told them that they were both vegan ones. Yeah. And he was shocked. Yeah. And he was like, no, 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 you fooled me. Sorry, no, they're both vegan. Yeah, I, I knew it. He just backtracked completely. And I often feel if I say, you know, I was really lucky enough to get sent a delivery from All Plants. Nice. And I said to my mum, try this try this vegan. It was a curry. It was so nice. It was yeah. one of the best I've ever had. And she goes, oh, no, I won't like it because it's vegan. And I was like, you haven't even tried it yet. Mm-hmm. And often that's the first barrier. And, you know, a lot of people say that Beyond Meat is not good for you. And sure. this is bad for you. And, you know, eating so much processed food. And I think I was a bad example of that because I was like sitting there eating like chicken nuggets. And like, I, the, that's the problem with me. I just love eating processed foods. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but the vegetarian or vegan. <laughs> but. You know, that's the worry. You know, if you're going to let go of meat in your diet, which is supposedly nutritious, healthy, it's natural. Mm-hmm. We'll come on to that in a minute. Sure. Replacing those foods with the Beyond Meat Burger every day is not going to be healthy for you. Well, I mean, it, it, it depends. There have been some studies. Of course, the, the research isn't anywhere near as comprehensive as it should be. Mm-hmm. But the early research that's been done comparing plant-based, even you know, processed alternatives to their meat counterparts shows that actually consuming the, the plant-based alternatives reduces certain cardiovascular risk factors. So it's, it's not as simple as saying that because something's processed, it is automatically less healthy than something else. Most, you know, most of these meat products processed. that is processed anyway. Yeah. So not only do you have the processing aspect, you also have things like nitrates, which cause colon cancer, certain saturated fats, you know, that can cause all kinds of health complications and heme iron, which can cause certain health complications. So it's not quite as simple as that. But the caveat is, is a Beyond Meat burger the healthiest thing you can consume? No, yes. no, no, no. Is it healthier than a, a black bean and quinoa burger? No, of yeah. course not. So we have to be realistic. You know, processed plant-based alternatives, a lot of them at least, are not healthy staples, but that doesn't mean that they're unhealthier than their meat counterparts. And it doesn't mean mm-hmm. that you can't enjoy them from time to time. It just means treat them as a, a treat. A burger is a luxury, not not a daily That's food true. item. Shouldn't be, should it? <laughs> Shouldn't be. I, I have to tell myself that on a regular basis too. So what do you say to some people who think, look, I want to try, but I don't want to label myself, you know, as a full on vegan, just in case I want to try three times a week or four times a week? Well, I mean, I, th- I think there's no harm in labels are labels, right? It's, it's all about how we identify. I think that one of the things, one of the things that I've a vegan shouldn't do is hold their whole identity around veganism. Mm. And I, I say that myself because I'm someone who's obviously very outspoken about veganism. A lot of people who know me know me f- because of veganism. So for me, it, it's a massive part of my de- identity, but I don't, yeah. it's it's not everything that defines me. Yeah. So I think how you choose to label yourself is entirely up to you. So you don't have to go around and say, I'm vegan, I'm vegan if you don't want to. And and if, the, if part of the apprehension around that is you're worried that you're setting yourself up to you know, have your friends dig at you if you if you don't do it for longer than a week or two, or you don't go past veganuary or whatever it might be. I think you just ease yourself into it. Mm. The way that I see it is that there's no point going hard for a week and then giving up. Veganism, to see its benefits, both personally as well as socially and societally, has to be something we do. And we, you know, we do for, well, hopefully the rest of our lives, I would of course argue. And so the most important thing is how do we get there and then stay there? So d- don't go hard for a week, go, oh, I can't do it, I give up. Just ease yourself into it. And and that doesn't mean necessarily to take steps. I say what I would advocate for is simplify the process down. What food do you already like consuming? You know, mm. it's probably a pastas, curries, mm. stir fries, whatever it might be. Think of the food that you already like to cook and you already like to eat. How can you make it vegan? Because yeah. most of the time the meals we cook at home are eighty percent plant based. It's just we add chicken in or we add beef in. Well, add something else in instead. And 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 by doing that, we realize we're not reinventing the wheel. We're just adding some nice shiny alloys, right? We're just changing it slightly. But fundamentally, the same thing exists. It's just we've made a couple of swaps here and there. And just simplify it right down for yourself and then ease in. So true. I think, you know, there's so many good arguments here. And often the last one I'm going to give back to you now, sorry. I know I've come and said, what about this? Um, Is a lot of people say, you know, it's natural to us to kill animals. Right. Okay. So we've done it for years. We have canines. Sure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And our bodies, I heard this argument someone said to me, our bodies are now 
uh, made to consume meat. And I said, well, how am I alive then? Because I'm vegetarian. Right. But, you know, they say, well, our bodies are adaptive to eating meat. So, for example, if we eat meat, we're not going to be completely sick. Sure. So sh their argument is surely if we have the teeth that support us eating meat, if our bodies take meat, if we now can have lactose, I know loads of people are lactose intolerant, yeah. but surely we're meant to eat meat because you know we don't judge animals in the wild no. for killing other animals. I already know the answer to all of these things, but I want you to explain <laughs> it more articulately. Um, and look, the animals in the wild is very, you know, it's obvious, isn't it? Let's be real. They don't, they have to do it to survive. We yeah. don't have to do it to survive. Yeah. But the argument of, you know, it, it's the natural food chain. Mm -hmm. if, a, if I stood in front of a lion, they would eat me. So I'm obviously, you know, at the top of the food chain as a human. Right. Why can't I eat other animals? I mean, like, as you rightly say, Shamani, um, animals in the wild do what they do because they have to. Yeah. You know, we don't go to Sainsbury's or Tesco or wherever and, and buy beef because our life depends on it. And also we are morally very advanced beings we're not we're not we're not pure moral beings that's that's of course true but we are able to make complex moral decisions and rationalize things in, the, in what we presume at least is a very unique way compared to other animals you know we see that based on how we interact with one another how we have um, social contracts and we have mm. um, philosophical belief systems that we use to challenge ourselves over the way that we act and our behaviors and all of these very uh, I would argue probably uniquely human things right that the complexity of how we can discuss mm. topics and because of that, we have an increased and an, and an advanced awareness of the implications of how we live. Mm -hmm. We basically, this was a very long winded way of saying, we are understanding of the moral implications of our choices in a unique way. A lion doesn't, a lion, as far as I'm aware, can't survive off plants, but even if they could, they don't have the intellect to know how to, they don't have the availability of those plant foods to be able to do so. And they don't have the, the, the moral intuition to be able to understand why that would be preferable. So We're not lions and we shouldn't, we shouldn't base our morals on that of wild animals. Otherwise society would be much, much worse, of course. And so this idea of something being natural, let's say, let's say it is natural. Does that mean it's better? I mean, let's look at diseases. You know, mm. Diseases are natural but we have synthetic medicines to treat them. We live in homes, we have heating. None of these things are, are natural. We don't find them in, in the world. Agriculture isn't natural. Agriculture is man-made. It uses fertilizers and it uses technology and it uses all of these things that science and, and our intellect have allowed us to use. Mm. None of this is natural. We don't live in a natural way and thank goodness we don't because we wouldn't be able to survive if we did, especially not with 8 billion people, of course, but the reason that we have the comfortable lives that we have, where we can pursue careers and watch Netflix and have phones and have conversations like we are now with podcasts mm -hmm. is because we don't live naturally. So I, I think we should be less concerned on what is natural and more on what is beneficial. So sure, is has it been in our history to hunt down a, a wildebeest and, and, and gorge on their flesh? Yeah, we've, we've done it for tens of thousands of years. Should we still do it? Well, no. I mean, we've killed each other for tens of thousands of years. Is is humans defending their territory natural? Well, probably. Should we do it? Certainly not. Because we're more advanced now. We, we don't need to do that. We can Basically, <laughs> let's not think about what other animals do. Let's think about what we can do and think less about what's natural and more about what's beneficial. And look, there's no denying that we can eat meat and live to 80, 90. Many people do. Many people don't, but many people do. And there's no denying that we have certain uh, biological traits that may help us. Mm -hmm. But when we think about our canines, you know, herbivorous animals have canines, the saber-toothed deer, for example, they're not eating animals. And also, not that I want anyone to do this, <laughs> but if our canines are so good at tearing flesh, think of an animal, yeah. think about finding them on the side of the road and think about biting through them with your canines not going to happen. No. We have to cook the meat to tenderize it. And we yeah. use knives and forks and we use steak knives because steak is extra hard to bite through. Mm -hmm. Basically, we have to do all of these different things to make meat nice and soft and succulent because <laughs> when it's raw and chewy, it's pretty hard to eat even with these canines that we have. Apart from there's weirdos online like Liver King who just well, eats it, the raw meat. That's true. Although all the steroids, steroids help I him out. That. <laughs> yeah. I saw that. He finally got yeah. called out for no, that, yeah, didn't exactly, he? Exactly, yeah. So there's a new phenomenon that's happening that's mm -hmm. around lab meat. Sure. Let's talk a little bit around that. So yeah. do you know what lab meat is? Yeah. Um, lab meat is basically where we take the cells of an animal and then we build those cells up to form meat. Okay. So fundamentally what, what we could do is we could take um, the cells from the muscles of a cow. Mm -hmm. We can then use some growth fluids. We can put in some vitamins and such, and we can theoretically produce a piece of steak or a burger, or basically flesh of these animals. So what that means is that we have the meat 
but without having to kill the animal. Right. Which is kind of amazing, really, when you think about yeah. the technology behind that. It's, we can get what we want but without all the baggage that we don't like. But are we still not exploiting the animal? Because I guess we don't need milk. We don't kill the animal when we're taking milk away. But all dairy cows are killed in slaughterhouses when their production declines. Slaughter yes. is intrinsic to dairy and eggs as well. Okay. Um, so even though an animal isn't killed when we take their milk, when their milk production declines, when they can no longer be impregnated to have babies, the That's farmer right. can't make money off them anymore. So he sen- sells them to a slaughter company who will who will butch them and the farm will profit off them that way. So every dairy cow and egg laying hen is also slaughtered. It's just it. they have all that extra baggage of being forcibly impregnated and, and all the stuff that happens to dairy cows um, and okay. other stuff that happens to hens as well. Um, so is it exploitation? In its most basic form, yes. And what I mean by that is we are exploiting an animal because we want their cells, because we want to produce meat. Mm -hmm. But is that exploitation inherently wrong or inherently, does it cause something that we'd view as a moral concern? Probably not, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And that's because we're not causing suffering. We're not taking their life. We're not necessarily violating their their ability to live a happy and free life. Because theoretically, you could take um, a biopsy, so a small little biopsy, um, or you could take a, a feather from a fallen, from, you know, it's fallen off a chicken. Again, that's not necessarily how it's being done right now, but you don't have to take large chunks out of an animal. You just need to take some cells. Um, taking cells doesn't require causing suffering or harm necessarily. So in terms of an exploitation, is it technically? Yes. Is it immoral? No, because we're not mm-hmm. violating an animal in a way that's going to cause them the the harm and suffering that we would view as a moral concern. So it's it's an ethical way of getting what we want. So could you be vegan, but also consume lab meat? I think so, yeah. Really? Well, again, it depends how you view veganism, right? If we view it as being about meat, then technically no. But veganism isn't about meat. Mm. It's about what happens to animals. So if we can get rid of what happens to animals and have meat, there's no reason why a vegan can consume the lab-grown meat. Because but you can it, have a plant-based diet, right? I mean, yeah, a plant-based diet would probably not have lab-grown yeah. meat because it's not Because it's not plant-based? Yeah. How interesting. Yeah. So would you, so for people who are saying, you know, when is this lab meat going to come out? Do you know, I'm asking you as if like you're this lab meat in, in, <laughs> info. I've got info my lab coat on. Yeah. Um, well, it, it depends. It is actually already available, but only in Singapore right now. Okay. Um, so in Singapore, you can get lab grown chicken. Now, in terms of its commercial viability, it still needs to be scaled up, still needs to be made financially mm-hmm. viable to get into supermarkets and such. So estimates vary. I've heard 2030, I've heard 2040. Okay. The truth is we don't really know yet, mm-hmm. but it is making leaps and bounds. I think in 2014, the first lab-grown beef burger was was uh, consumed and it cost something like $100,000. It might have even <gasps> been more. It was like an outrageously expensive no food. But since then, it's it, the prices come right down because the technology's yes. scaled up, the, you know, the awareness and the, uh, the scientific understanding has become so much more advanced since then. So we don't 100% know. What we need, firstly, are for governments to approve it. So the FDA has approved, I believe, certain lab-grown meat products in the US, mm-hmm. which means that they've been deemed viable to be sold to consumers. That's the first hurdle, right? And then we can start to think about the commercial viability. Okay. There is another technology which is available. Okay. It's called precision fermentation. And this okay. doesn't require an animal. Basically, you take um, the protein, let's say casein, which is the protein that we find in, in dairy, and it, what we can then do is by using this technique called precision fermentation, which sounds awfully complicated, yeah. we can actually create the proteins that are found in these food sources but without the animals. And those foods are becoming available already. In America, there's a company called Perfect Day that use it, but it's starting to scale up here. And, and the most exciting thing is like 99% of the world's insulin is produced in this way. Citric acid, which is found in pretty much everything nowadays, is, yeah. fa- is produced in this way. Um, rennet, which is found in cheese, is produced in this way. So the technology already exists and it's been used in food products already. It's just about using that technology to produce um, animal type proteins instead. And that's probably going to happen a lot sooner. And I think people's attitude perhaps will then change unless it's drastically expensive. I mean, I'm sure it's not going to be a hundred thousand (laughs) pounds. Not when it reaches the shelves. Um, But you know, I think hopefully that will help people's attitude to change because it's so funny. I think when you go through something, so one of my friends recently was pregnant. Yeah. She was breastfeeding and she said, I'm going to become vegan after this because she said, I cannot believe how hard it is to breastfeed. Right. And she was like, it's so cruel. She right. was like, it's so difficult and it's so cruel. So she's like, I'm never drinking milk again. And she right. stopped drinking milk and she's like, I think I'm gonna become vegan. Oh. And she's like a full on meat, meat eater oh, anyway. Wow, so I was like, are you gonna do it? And she was like, oh, I think I am actually, because you know, it's just crazy how 
she was like, I have to breastfeed for my child. Yeah. If I should do it for someone else's child, she was like, I would go mad. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, I think, I think we are very ad- detached from everything, you know, especially when you've been raised also like me to think vegetarian is the way, vegetarianism is the way forward. Sure. You know, that's the way you're not killing animals. To go vegan, everyone suddenly just thinks you're this lunatic. Right, yeah. How do you feel around um, chickens as pets and they just naturally lay eggs? Would you eat their eggs? Um, I mean, it, it's it's a slightly more complex issue than just that. Um, there is definitely a situation where a chicken lays an egg and you eating that egg is not an ethical concern. Okay. Um, the problem with, with pet chickens is related to like how they've been selectively bred to produce lots of eggs. Oh, it has an impact okay. on their body, can lead to osteoporosis because the shells are made of calcium, blah, blah, blah. So basically I, I wouldn't advocate for doing so necessarily because there are things like um, treatments that can actually stop the hens from laying eggs, which is better for their bodies. Um, okay. But is it better than buying eggs from a, a farmer or from a supermarket? Absolutely, hands down. Um, but I don't view it as an ethical compromise necessarily. I just view it as significantly better. Um, yeah. But it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Uh, not to plug myself, but I do have yeah. a video about this issue if anyone's interested to get a, yeah. a slightly more in-depth um, feeling. But yeah, I mean, there is obviously a situation where there is an egg, you eat that egg. It's not an ethical concern. It's just that for at least 99% of people, especially in, in places like London where we are, is not the case. So, you know, you've been, you've been talking for, for years around veganism and you, now you've written two books. What's the one piece of advice you'd tell someone who's really skeptical around going vegan? Well, that's actually a really good question. Um, education is, is key to, to, to so many things. We're all ignorant about something, right? And, and that's, not, that's not a criticism. Mm-hmm. We, we can't know everything, right? Yeah. And, and so being ignorant isn't a fault. But the, the antidote is, of course, education, right? And f- when, I, when I meet people who are skeptical of veganism, I think the most important question is why? What is mm-hmm. it about that you're skeptical about? And have you actually looked into answering that skepticism? You know, if it's a health concern, well, have you looked at what the opposing argument is? And I think that the issue around most things, but indeed even, even this as well, is that when we hear something, we never really fact check it. I mean, TikTok and, and Instagram reels are sometimes just a, a devastating environment for misinformation to spread. They are. And it's really hard because people see something and they take it on face value. So what I would say is, is just, just have um, as much as you can, take an objective stance and look at the opposing arguments and then you can make a more informed decision. And, and the book that I've put together here, This is Vegan Propaganda, hopefully provides that opposing argument, but importantly, it has all the references in there. Mm. So every claim I'm making, every study I'm citing, you can go to the back, you can find it, you can go online, you can, you can fact check it yourself. And because it's so important in, in our modern world that we actually look into the information we're hearing because there is, there is so much misinformation. And um, you know, vegan or vegan alike, you know, mm. I, I say this to vegans as well, before we start saying something, just take a minute to make sure that what we're saying is true yeah. because we don't need to exaggerate anything. We don't need to enter into a situation where we're using hyperboles or any of this. We can just give the information to people and um, let them do with it what they want. And, and hopefully that's, it's, a, it's not a very succinct piece of advice, education. No, it's it's true though, because you know, there was, and I love the way you've put that into your book because there was that documentary, What the Health? Yes. And I remember so many people after said, well, I researched into it and actually they were, it was really, it wasn't correct. And yeah. I always think, how did you research into it afterwards and where are, where are your facts to go into it? Because ultimately, I think there's millions of different opinions in the world. You know, yeah. someone can say, look, eating this much meat in a burrito caused me to feel this. And someone can say, well, having this plant-based, it was just ridiculous, the, the arguments, people were arguing against that. Yeah. And I think What the Health did have studies there that they were fact-checking against. However, a lot of people found contradictory evidence within that as well. So that's a great point. Um, that's a really good point. Another thing is we can we can find something to validate anything. You know, yes. you can go online and, and find a, an argument f- for drinking urine these days. I right? could. There's, yeah. there's everything online for everything. Now. Yeah. Um, so the, as well as finding a source for something, we have to look at where who's 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 providing that source. Mm. Um, and this where it can become a little bit more complex. But look for for reputable organisations. Yes. Places like the United Nations, places like the WHO, places like um, you know um, institutions like universities who mm. have highly regarded scientific establishments within them, like Harvard or Oxford or Cambridge or wherever it might be, because not all science is good science. 
you know, look for funding, look for things like that, because it is true that it can be really complex. And actually that I feel bad in a way saying that because it places a lot of expectation on the average person who's listening to this, where I go, right, do some education, but yes. make sure it's coming from these sources, check the fund. It's really hard. But I think the simplest way of doing it is to, is to look for quantity as well as quality. And if you have a situation where all of these organizations, these, these reputable, respectable organizations are telling us a similar thing, it's probably because they're onto something. Right. Um, and this Instagram influencer who's telling us the opposite is probably not. And, and that's why I think it's really important that we, um, we, we do educate ourselves, but within that, we look at where this information is coming from and what is the consensus of opinion here. And, and that can help guide us as well. Yeah, I think you're right. Looking on Instagram and TikTok is probably not your best sources. And, no. you know, it, I was speaking to a doctor earlier and he said there was, he had to debunk this thing around doing a period face mask. And eating testicles. Eating t okay. Yeah. So he That's was like, I need, to, he was like, I had to do a video on debunking people using their period as a face mask because right. there were loads of people that were saying it was amazing for your skin. And he's like, it's outrageous. Right. So, you know, for every opinion online now, you can find a counter argument about anything. Yeah. And so someone will always be there to call you out and say, well, actually, I found this research paper saying the complete opposite of you. So you're an idiot, yeah. you know? It's, it's, it's absurd. And I think, you know, being on social media, you must have it too. You kind of just have to filter through that noise. I have so, I have uh, someone on my Instagram who, for some reason, loves to comment on every post for oh, something yeah. negative. Oh, no. Now, I could block her. I've blocked a lot of people who are just really crazy. Sure. But hers always entertained me. And right. I've, always, I've actually yeah. just kept her because I find it quite entertaining that she's always got something negative to say, <laughs> but says it in such a roundabout way that I'm just like, you know what? I'm not going to block you. I, I actually enjoy it every day that you when you message something sure. because... It's just so funny. Yeah. Like it's like you're trying to poke a hole in something out of out of nothing. Yeah. And I think with social media, unfortunately, you have to kind of grow a thick skin, don't you? And and and, and go through that. So, so, so especially when you advocate for things that can be viewed say. as contentious as well. It's certainly. So. What's um before we close? I feel like I'm I've, I've tried to close this podcast a few times. I will have a few questions to ask you. Yeah. Sorry. That's all right. What's um one of the hardest moments you have you've had actually? Because I think being an advocate for something on social media is really tough. When I've spoken around things that are a little bit controversial or things that are calling people out or as we've mentioned throughout this podcast, kind of attacking your identity, mm. what are some of the harshest things that have happened? It's interesting. Um, I mean, look, people have criticized me um, or people have, you know, said things about me, nasty things or, you know, called into question, you know, the integrity of what I do or whatever. And and that's hard, but I think the thing about social media that I found, it, and, and it, it's quite easy to say this because it's it's not always so simple for everyone, and I, and I appreciate that. But for me, I can ignore things a little bit easier. You know, when I upload something to Facebook, I don't want to know what the farmers are saying. Yeah. Well, I can ignore that, you know. So I, I don't have the tendency of, of scrolling through comments necessarily. Um, and so for me, I can kind of get that distance, but I know that it's not always as easy for some people. For me, I think what, what upsets me about it is when... When we talk about veganism, it's not necessarily my position or the feelings of myself that I'm concerned about. Obviously, I don't want to feel upset. I don't want to feel hurt. But I, I recognize mm -hmm. that advocating for something that is societally quite contentious and, and being very outspoken about it will lead to people criticizing me. I get that. And that that's fair enough. And people have the right to scrutinize and the right to criticize within, within you know, respectful boundaries, hopefully. Um, but for me, I think what's hard is when people don't think about the the actual victims in this conversation. You know, and I've, uh, the hardest situations for me have always been things that have happened offline. Okay. Going to a farm, going to a slaughterhouse. You know, I've, I've been in a slaughterhouse. I've been to pig farms and chicken farms and dairy farms and, and the like. And I've seen things happening to animals and animals experiencing things, animals enduring things, animals making noises and, and looking at you with, with their eyes, with, with pain and, and, you know, and... Um, you know, almost asking for, for mercy, looking at mm. me with, with this expression they have, you know, animals about to go into a slaughterhouse, about to go to their death. And that for me is by, by, by far the hardest thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that what often happens is people view veganism from the position of the human, mm. when actually we need to view it from the position of the animal, the non-human animal, because what I'm advocating for is not my feelings, it's not my life. No one's coming to kill me. No one's coming to cut my throat. Mm. And I think one of the, the uniquely hard things about advocating for veganism is I'm not being a voice for myself. 
Mm. I'm, I'm trying to be a voice for someone else who can't articulate their plight, who is not given the ability to, to be seen, who's hidden from us, who's kept away from us in, in, in cages or in concrete pens, or you know, their screams are not heard by us because they're in slaughterhouses. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the challenge that I have is getting people to not see me advocating for myself, but try and see me as advocating for someone else. And that that is the hardest thing that I have. And yeah. the experiences that I've borne witness to, that I've, that I've seen that, are not experiences that I've personally felt. They're not experiences that have happened to me, but experiences that I've witnessed happening to someone else. Definitely. Out of that, that's 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 definitely the hardest thing. And that, yeah, social media is not is a tricky beast. Don't get me yeah. wrong, but I'd much rather be a, an influencer on social media than an animal in a, in a slaughterhouse. No, see, again, your response is just so empathetic. And throughout this throughout this podcast, everything you've said is with such calmness and grace. And mm. I need to learn more from you because sometimes when people say things to me, I'm like, how can you say that? Like, what's wrong with you? You're such a terrible person. And I react emotionally, which I think shuts but it's know, understandable. People, people down. It's an emotional I say people, I'm talking about, you know, close, <laughs> clo close people to me, not just random people. I don't just shout at random people, by the way, just telling <laughs> everyone. But, you know, I, I think that is... That it is hard, hard not to, but I think having someone like you ex explains things very articulately, even on your YouTube channel, even in on Instagram, it's very easy to digest and it's very easy to understand. So, look, I thank you very much for coming on and thank you for, you know, releasing this incredible book as well. Thank you, Shiba. And um, hopefully... And you know Dr. Gemma Newman as well. She's, she's a star, amazing. isn't she? So exactly. she, she can help you with any of those concerns, I'm sure. I think my biggest concern is really just around people thinking I'm being difficult. Right. But I think that's it. If I'm honest, I've spoken about this on the podcast so many times, and I think that's a deeper issue I need to dive into. So most most things are deeper than we necess we sometimes we sometimes realize. But you know, it's social situations are the ones that can be trickiest for people. Yeah. But I think as long as you communicate openly and honestly right at the beginning, you can set mm -hmm. certain boundaries. And as long as you say to people, look, this is what I'm doing, I'm not yeah. asking you to do it, I'm just saying this is what I'm doing, please respect those boundaries right. and understand that in situations this is what I will be requiring. Yeah. And nowadays most restaurants have vegan they, options. They do. You know, most people know how to cook a simple vegan meal you know you're right as well you just it's just you're replacing one thing i'll just say just start cooking and then just don't add in whatever for one meal it's That's fine it. yeah exactly. i'll let you know how it goes oh, yeah. the vegan propaganda has worked exactly perfect <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much you're welcome I appreciate thank it you. everyone and thank you so much for listening and watching this podcast wherever you're listening or watching if you could please press the follow like and subscribe button it would really mean the world to me